Well, let's start with the legacy of the special court uh, for Sierra Leone. Um, I think we have to concede that the court had a very troubled um, start. Uh, its first prosecutor, its first chief investigator, as well as its first, um, the first president of the court, um, all conducted themselves in a somewhat controversial manner, which did not help with the um, reputation of the court. And, and sadly, certainly in the early years, uh, the institution was not a particularly popular uh, institution uh, within Sierra Leone. Many Sierra Leoneans regarded it as um, a well-oiled international roadshow of very well-paid uh, foreigners uh, coming into um, Sierra Leone to deal with just a handful of, of cases. Luckily, the um, conduct of um, the court um, and its reputation has been, I think, salvaged by its good work in more recent years, particularly with um, the conviction of um, Charles Taylor. Um, on the plus side, um, I think the, the court has contributed to the building of um, the rule of law uh, in Sierra Leone and the wider region of West Africa and indeed the continent uh, itself. I think that should be viewed in a positive light. Well, it has left behind a state-of-the-art um, court building, which is now being used on a daily basis by the Sierra Leone judiciary. And of course, that's always very helpful infrastructure to, to leave behind. But I, I doubt that it has... Um, had a major impact on the day-to-day um, -day operations of um, the Sierra Leonean judiciary as well as um, the system or the administration of criminal justice uh, in that country. Um, it does seem to me that um, the administration of justice, um, and here we, I'm thinking of detective services, prosecution service, uh, as well as the uh, judiciary, remain largely in the same state they were um, before the, the special court commenced its work. And I think that's largely due to um, a lack of um, planning from the outset as to how to actually mentor local detectives, prosecutors and judges and to train them in order to leave behind um, a capacity that could be used going forward. I, I should say that this is um, not just a shortcoming of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, but tends to be a shortcoming of virtually all uh, special or hybrid courts uh, around the world. Way too little attention is, is paid to uh, mentoring and, and training and creating a capacity that uh, will continue once uh, the internationals have left. Typically, we, we, we see that uh, the bulk of the work uh, is done by foreigners. Um, and while some um, local people are typically employed at low levels, uh, conducting menial jobs such as security, um, logistics, um, as well as staffing administrative positions in the registrar's office, comparatively few are employed as um, senior investigators prosecutors and, and judges, um, many who were employed for various reasons didn't last that long in, in those positions. Uh, so that's, that's the drawback, is, is that, um, that meaningful legacy of creating a capacity, a specialised capacity to investigate complex crimes, such as international crimes. Um, I, I don't think that... Um, has been bequeathed to, uh, to Sierra Leone. Uh, it perhaps isn't true to say that um, that experience uh, broke new ground uh, because it's not unusual for commissions and courts to work in a parallel side-by-side -side process. Um, I, I should add that um, there is something of a myth out there that suggests that this 
dual operation of the TRC and special court was by some grand design that was part of a, a plan that was hatched to ensure an overall integrated approach to transitional justice in, uh, in Sierra Leone. For those, of course, familiar with the history, they will know that that simply is not correct. Um, the special court was never part of the uh, original um, uh, approach of transitional justice in that country. The TRC was a product of the Lome Peace Accord, and uh, the special court obviously uh, did not feature in that special um, accord because the, the peace accord didn't make provision for criminal prosecutions. In fact, it was specifically excluded. Uh, the TRC was established under the accord uh, in order to uh, address the past and provide for uh, a measure of accountability given the absence of um, criminal justice. Um, I will deal with the question of um, amnesty shortly because that the next question that was posed to me. Um, so the special court only came about uh, subsequent uh, to the Lume Peace Accord following um, disturbances when um, when both uh, members of uh, the government of Sierra Leone as well as the Revolutionary United Front, the RUF, broke the terms of the peace accord. Um, at that point in time, uh, President Kabar then asked the international community to set up a um, international court in order to investigate uh, the breaking of the uh, accord by the RUF. In fact, uh, uh, he should have asked for an investigation into the role of the government itself because the government also broke key aspects of the uh, peace accord. Nonetheless, the international community ultimately responded with a special court to look at, into um, uh, violations of uh, international criminal law um, throughout the uh, or through significant years uh, of the preceding conflict. Um, so the point I'm simply making is that the two institutions were dropped into the mix on an ad hoc basis. They, they, they it wasn't part of some holistic or, or integrated plan. And perhaps that's the first lesson. It should have been. Um, and so the lesson to be drawn, I, I think, is um, where it's where you do wish to have both a criminal justice and a truth and reconciliation approach. It should be part of a holistic, integrated plan, as opposed to an ad hoc measure in which uh, the two bodies are simply um, dropped into a uh, fairly volatile situation and expected to uh, work optimally. We know from history that the two institutions did not work um, optimally, partly because of that reason. Um, there was never any attempt to uh, synchronize uh, their work and reach agreements on matters of principle and practice, even though they were expected to work side by side and even though they were investigating um, the same subject matter um, now, we know from previous experience that it's entirely possible for commissions of inquiry and criminal courts to work in, in harmony um, without um, conflict. Uh, we saw that in South Africa, um, where you had the Truth Commission working while um, criminal investigations and, 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 and some prosecutions were proceeding. Um, and we saw in that country that um, the rights of individuals uh, to appear before the Truth Commission was enshrined in law, as well as in the Constitution. Um, people have uh, the right of, to express themselves, that's the freedom of expression. They have um, the right to know. Uh, the people have the right to the truth. Um, Unfortunately, those rights were not respected by the Special Court of Sierra Leone, which adopted a territorial approach to the detainees um, held in its custody. If um, the leadership of the court at the time were far-sighted and had an understanding of transitional justice, an understanding that both bodies um, had a role to play, 
um, then they would not have um, objected to the uh, appearance in public hearings of the detainees um, in their custody. Uh, there were certainly ways and means of ensuring that um, the rights of those detainees were respected and the um, prospects of justice were not undermined. So if one were, were to draw um, lessons from the Sierra Leone experience, I, I would say that uh, firstly, um, one should attempt to draw up an integrated approach to transitional justice and um, not to simply drop institutions together on an ad hoc basis. There should be an attempt to reach agreement in principle and on the details of operating together in terms of access to witnesses, access to information. Um, and then uh, one should enshrine uh, in law the rights of, of um, individuals to appear before uh, the Truth Commission, uh, which the other bodies must respect. Um, the necessary safeguards can be introduced, such as ensuring that individuals who might appear before both bodies are legally represented. Um, but at that point, um, no particular body should be able to stand in the way of, uh, of the other. Uh, the Truth Commission ultimately found that it was unable to condemn the uh, amnesty uh, that was agreed to in the Lomé Peace Accord, even though it conceded that um, amnesties were generally uh, undesirable and that certain amnesties, for example, those um, awarded by outgoing uh, military uh, dictators and uh, junters do themselves, um, was uh, certainly objectionable. Uh, the Truth Commission in its report uh, noted that in the context of uh, Sierra Leone, which had seen some 10 years of um, uh, unrelenting um, violence that had claimed the lives of tens of thousands, which had seen uh, many more uh, injured and amputated and, uh, and traumatized, um, with no end in sight. Um, uh, and by 1999, the response of the international community had been um, entirely inadequate. Uh, there was no international peacekeeping force to come through and uh, keep the peace, uh, in which case um, we might um, have seen credible prosecutions take place. And there was a regional peacekeeping force uh, called ECOMOG, uh, but sadly they were unable to uh, maintain the peace and from time to time even engaged in violations themselves. The Commission took, took the view that um, in, in those circumstances where there was no end in sight uh, to the war and the international community was not stepping in in any effective manner, um, in order to bring uh, the parties to the negotiating table and to reach peace, um, the amnesty at that time uh, was an acceptable price uh, to pay. Um, and I, uh, although I wasn't a commissioner at the time, I was a chief investigator, I, I agreed with the, the, the views of the commissioners. One simply can't get on one's high and, and, and mighty horse um, and uh, demand that uh, uh, principle be adhered to um, in the face of ongoing carnage. Uh, one has to stop the carnage and if the international community is not going to step in to stop the carnage then one mustn't then on a post facto basis uh, criticize uh, those on the ground who try to seek the peace and stop the, um, the bloodshed through, uh, through an amnesty. So it was in fact um, the, the amnesty that helped to uh, secure the peace um, in 1999 through the uh, Lomé Peace Accord. There's simply no uh, questioning that. The Truth Commission also made the point that one has to be careful um, when um, disrespecting uh, amnesties uh, because one may introduce um, a lack of confidence in, in such uh, agreements going forward if they are so easily uh, disrespected um, and, uh, and ignored. Um, now, in terms of my own view as to uh, whether one should have amnesties in peace accords, ideally you don't want an amnesty in a peace accord. 
um, and amnesty should always be an absolute last uh, resort. Um, you only really want an amnesty when there's no alternative. And, th and this is particularly the case when uh, the most serious crimes ha have been uh, committed, uh, such as war crimes and, and crimes against humanity. So when peace has been uh, restored, um, uh, you know, for example, situations where you have one party um, emerging victorious over another, uh, typically you do see uh, prosecutions uh, proceeding in those uh, circumstances, or when the international community intervenes and restores the peace. That then provides conditions for uh, criminal prosecutions to proceed. But when the carnage is ongoing, um, there isn't a clear victor, and the international community has chosen not to intervene to restore the peace, um, that then opens the door to recourse to um, an amnesty as an absolute last resort, as undesirable as it may be. Um, one cannot take a theoretical or academic approach to say, well, um, one doesn't want an amnesty, so, so therefore that country must be condemned to, to years of more carnage and, uh, and bloodshed. Uh, that, that, that's a completely ridiculous and uh, unacceptable policy decision to take uh, because it's going to cost human lives and suffering. Um, and certainly for a country such as Sierra Leone, given what it had been through um, during the course of the 90s, that was not uh, an acceptable uh, policy approach to, to adopt. Yes, to, today um, Sierra Leone um, has enjoyed um, a number of years of peace and, uh, and, 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 and democracy. Uh, and that is in part due to the fact that the compromise um, was made at the Lomé Peace Accord to include the amnesty. Um, and I, I do think that um, the work of the Truth Commission and the Special Court has contributed to establishing uh, respect for the rule of law um, and the journey that uh, the country has been on um, through those two institutions, um, I believe, has also contributed to um, ensuring some guarantees of non-recurrence of those terrible, violent days. Uh, Sierra Leoneans have taken steps to ensure that um, that kind of um, conflict uh, will not happen again. In particular, um, Sierra Leoneans have taken the report of the Truth Commission very seriously uh, indeed. Um, it has struck a resonance uh, amongst many sectors of society um, and many uh, key actors, both within um, organisations such as Parliament, um, but throughout civil society have pushed for the implementation of, of those recommendations and, and many key recommendations uh, have been implemented, uh, including, for example, recommendations dealing with um, endemic corruption, which the Truth Commission concluded was one of the key reasons, one of the key underlying factors behind the conflict in the first place. Um, key recommendations have been introduced, such as giving the Anti-Corruption Commission uh, powers of prosecution, uh, to, together with recommendations around uh, code of ethics and uh, disclosure of assets and the like. Um, and more recently, we, we've seen the uh, government of Sierra Leone accepting many of the central recommendations around the building of a, of a new constitution for uh, Sierra Leone. So I think all these factors have um, contributed to building a, a more stable and peaceful uh, Sierra Leone. Um, so all in all, I, I think Sierra Leone can be seen as something of a success story. Um, having said that, it still has a, has a long way to go. Um, um, most Sierra Leoneans um, still lack access to um, basic services and, and amenities. Um, most Sierra Leoneans are, are still in a fairly desperate um, economic state. But nonetheless, um, through the work of uh, institutions such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, and the Special Court, um, the building blocks, I believe, have been put in place uh, to build a new society uh, in which the horrors and violence of the past uh, will become unthinkable.